now we're going to work with a big brush um, and lay in skin tone really quickly. There are still things like smaller details that I'm not going to do it in paint at all um, that I'll wait until the end to go back in and do with something like a fine point um, marker or um, even go back in with like a 6B pencil. So there's some detail work that I won't do in a paint layer at all, right? Paint is about laying in big shadows and laying in big color and then moving to a smaller, more um, uh, fast on its feet media to do small details. So um, I'm going to do a skin tone we talked about in class. Right, that skin tones, you can make most skin tones from something like a yellow ochre, something like a, a red violet, and either an indigo, or I like uh, Payne's Gray, which is like a blue gray um, that I told you about in class. I actually don't have my Payne's Gray at home right now because of um, the quarantine, so I kind of mixed my own version um, from a lot of different colors, right? Um, but that's my favorite go-to kind of shadow shade. Um, so, but for skin tone, that's a great place to use your junk color. I've got a kind of a yellow ochre and probably a Venetian red that were in this little pan here. I'm going to do a test and see what that looks like. Oh, that's quite orange. It's pretty for something else, but perhaps not this. No, but that's actually a thing. That's a good point of um, discussion though, because look, look what happens when I add water to that. Um, so if I did want to go for something that's more of a Caucasian skin tone, that thing that looked kind of rusty, right, um, is now kind of peachy in that. Um, so I might be in a place where if I just keep watering that sucker down, and I might be in a good um, Caucasian skin tone. Um, and let's mix into some browner tones so we can have like a fuller range. Uh, okay, so I'm going to add brown into that and see what happens. So now I've got something that's olive tan. I'm gonna look and see what that looks like through the camera. It's pretty warm actually. Let me go ahead and lay that down as a base, right? Because I can have that be a base that I can then add different um, tones and highlights and shadows to and I can shift that to be a lot of different skin tones. So I like that as a starting place. I'm gonna go ahead because I did this um, shadow layer and I'm gonna lay that across most of the visible skin. I'm going to leave a little bit of the white of the paper showing though. Let's go ahead and say that this top part here is a little bit sheer. Um, and I'm going to give a skin tone, not a lot, not deep and dense and kind of fully saturated skin tone, but I'm going to lay in some skin underneath that so that if I want that to be sheer, I'm just going to go ahead and once it's dry, I'll paint my fabric color over it and um, some of that skin will show through and that's how we'll know that it's transparent. In silhouette, we're probably in the 1850s. Um, so let's go ahead and say that this is like, um, oh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make it out of chiffon. In period, it would have probably been something like a cotton voile. Um, but um, let's say that um, as was the case in that period, um, there was probably a chemisette or a corset cover and a corset underneath this, right? So this part here in the upper dress probably would have not been see-through to the skin, like she would have been arrested, right? Um, and similarly, there are probably several petticoats um, or skirts to hold this bell shape out under here, so her legs are similarly not visible. Like, we might be able to see the petticoats, um, which could be a design element, like we could have them be different colors or tones that then show through the transparent layer, right? But actually, her arm is a place that we should probably I'm gonna dip into this little sample I did down here since that's where I, I kind of live mixed her skin down here on the page. So um, I'll dip back into that. But so we would actually see, again, not like super saturated, but we'd see a bit of her arm um, in here. Right? Just even if you just hit kind of the underside or like the shadow side of the arm with a little bit of color, um, but you want to be able to tell your viewer that that's there. I should. Okay, so I'm gonna let that dry um, because I'm gonna paint over um, some of those skin tones that are in the dress, which means I need them to be completely dry so that they'll hold their painted shape. 
um, and so that I can do a transparent watercolor layer on top of them. Um, and even in terms of like painting towards the hair and the dress that's up around her neck, um, I, if I try to work on that part right now while this is still actively wet, these um, those layers of paint are all just going to kind of blur together. Um, and that can be pretty if it's intentional, but in this case we want those color shapes to be isolated. So I put in um, the skin tone, so you can already see the underpainting underneath the shadow, uh, or the underneath the skin tone, so you can see how it blurred out, right? So it's already there, but the way, it, the nature of underpainting basically softens the shadow, right? So it's going to model into the form more than it would um, otherwise. So um, I'm going to go ahead again and use a big brush, which is what I had used to put in the skin. That way it lays it down really fast um, and is less likely to scrub up the um, color underneath. Um, there are two ways to lay down color with watercolor. One is to wet the area you want to paint with clear water and then drop the pigment into it. You can then continue to drop other pigments and paints um, that will then wet blend and blur out. The other is to do direct application where you can see the brush strokes. So, for our purposes with um, costume sketches, sometimes the direct application method is the best because the visible brush strokes that have some workability while they're drying um, can give um, the implication or the illusion of the direction of the cloth or the drape, right? So even though it might not be the best way to go for other types of watercolor painting, for fabric and clothing it actually has some advantages because um, the way that it leaves the white of the paper in some areas and not can help you get at things like highlight. So I've overpainted a little pink cast onto the dress. I'm going to go ahead and do the same on the top. And again, because we underpainted, you want to be a little cautious to not overly scrub the paper because that will rub up that underlying underpainting. And I don't know if you can see, um, but um, because we're laying the color on top, naturally that underpainting is kind of just ever so gently and very naturally and organically blending um, into the top layer, the transparent layer. So um, there's a, a natural kind of, um, I guess if we were working on a tablet, right? Uh, there's a natural, um, blending and scrubbing that's happening um, that we actually don't have to do much work at and we're just going to let water and nature and the paper do its work. Um, with watercolor it is best um, to keep wet areas away from one another unless you want them to blend together. So if I wanted to add another tone or color, well actually let's go ahead and for the sake of like looking at what happens if we do a wet blend, I'm going to use um, a Naples yellow which is one of my favorite kind of soft yellows. It's up here. Um, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like down here on the bottom of the paper in a second. Do a swatch. So depending on its water quantity, it can have really tremendous color shifts. It can go everywhere from like peach to something that almost looks like a beige or brown. Um, and when it's really watered down, it barely dusts the paper, but it's kind of this wonderful, perfect, really complex, um, warm pinkish yellow um, that works for a lot of different highlights. So I'm gonna go ahead and lay a little bit of that into sections of the dress to give it some additional kind of coloration and complexity. I'm gonna do it here too. I'm not gonna work too much on top of where there's that underlying skin tone because that will become a muddiness. For the purposes of showing the underpainting, I think you get the idea, right? Got a little bit of um, shine coming off of where it's really, really wet from our light reflection, so don't let that um, fool you. That will dry, and again, um, it will dry lighter than it appears right now. So the true color isn't seen yet. And if we wanted to do additional things like put in pattern or um, smaller paint detail, we want it to dry completely before we would do that. Um, right now is a great opportunity to lay in kind of soft, blendy um, 
color that might might underlie a pattern that we would want to render on top of it. So working wet is a good way to kind of mix in a lot of different base tones that you can then pull out later with something like a small brush or a colored pencil or a fine tip marker. So, um, but um, we're gonna let her be for a second.